forward, I'm going to introduce our moderator. Um, and I have to say, this, this person, this young lady is somebody that I met years ago um, who was coaching a volleyball clinic that my, that my daughter attended. And I was just struck by her presence, by her, um, just the way that she communicates and the way that she moves and the way that she interacts with young girls um, is absolutely amazing. And so um, I could not think of anyone better to moderate this session than um, Coach Penny Lucas-White. Um, so Coach Lucas-White uh, is a former USA national volleyball player and will be entering her 10th season as the head volleyball coach at Alabama State University for the 2020 season. During her time, um, the Lady Hornets have won six Southwestern Atlantic Conference championships including three seasons ago when the team finished off a perfect 18-0 run through the conference and a trip to the NCAA regionals. At one, at one point, the Lady Hornets reeled off 42 consecutive conference victories. In the 2019 campaign, she led the team to its fourth consecutive SWAC conference championship. So I want you all to please welcome Coach Penny Lucas-White. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ahada. So I am so honored, first of all, to be here with such a prestigious, very, very uh, accomplished group of successful women. So I kind of want to start off by saying um, we're going to act as though we're just sitting at the corporate table. We actually got a seat at the table today. My grandmother used to tell me, if they don't let you have a seat at the table, bring your folding chair. So ladies, we are here. I want to start off by saying welcome to our voices in the coaches in the coaching panel of the Up to Us Sports Women and Girls Sports Sym Symposium. We have an incredible lineup for you. First on deck, this panel of collegiate professional female athletes and coaches that work with youth and athletes in conversations about the role their coaches have played in their lives and their success and about the need for more coaches across all sports. First, I'll give you guys a brief introduction of each of these professional women. However, we'll also allow them a moment to give you more insight about who they are and what they represent and the purpose of their journeys here. First on deck, we have Ms. Jessica Cloy. She's a seven-time Paralympic medalist, Paralympic track and field, grant program coordinator with Adaptive Sports USA. Second on deck, we have Ms. Katie Holloway, three-time Paralympic medalist, sitting volleyball. And then we have Ms. Jarita Mitchell, up to us sports coach alumni, sports director for the Louisiana up to us sports. I'm from Louisiana too. And then we have the fourth on deck, we have Ms. Ch uh, Chastity Melvin, assistant coach of the Phoenix Mercury, former WNBA All-Star and North Carolina State University Hall of Famer. And then we have the, from my neighborhood in Neck of the Woods, Ms. Danielle Scott, five-time Olympian, two-time Olympic medalist, indoor volleyball, inductee of multiple Hall of Fames. Next on deck is Ms. Colette B. Smith, up to us sports ambassador, the NFL first African-American female coach, founder of Believe in You Incorporated. Last but not least, we got Dr. Jen Welter, the NFL's first female coach, founder of the Gridiron Girls. Welcome to all of you wonderful, well-accomplished women. It is an honor, an honor to be here with you. As I go across the screen, I'd like for you to just kind of tell, tell us that defining moment that you knew you were in your purpose, living the journey that was intended for you. I'll start with Dr. Walter, please. You know, for me, I grew up loving football and Yet it was the place in the world that I first learned that there was a difference between what boys could do and what girls would, could do. So when I made my first football team, I promised myself I would step up 
to every challenge the game put in my way. Cause there was no, there was no path for women in football at that time, right? Like they, they barely let us play. You know, we'd, we'd be sneaking, you know, some space on, on the edge of a field, right? Driving our cars up to play. And yet it was just this clear vision that we deserved more. And every time I heard the phrase, it's the final frontier for women in sports. I was like, all right, then let's get to work. Because when we win here, there is nothing we can't do. Very good. Ms. Jarita Mitchell, am I saying your name correctly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You are. Okay. <laughs> um, for me, uh, I am, you know, I grew up playing sports. I grew up playing all sports. And then when I got to high school, it kind of swung down to track and field and cross country. Um, I went to school to do something clinical and I came on as an upsize coach and I had a kid come up to me that played sports that said, are you going to be here tomorrow? Um, and in that moment, I knew that uh, these kids need somebody and they needed an outlet. They needed someone to show them that there are more things besides, well, I'm from New Orleans. So dance and parade season and band is the thing down here, um, that there are more ways to get active and do things. Um, and so that was my defining moment. Excellent. Ms. Chastity Melvin. Um, my defining moment was uh, when I was young, I think I was like 10 years old and my grandmother came out to the basketball course with me and the rest of my male cousins. And um, she talked to them about letting me on the court. <laughs> and uh, she said, it, she, said does, she, she asked the question, she said, does everyone eat here? When I cook and everyone said yes. And she said, well, if Chastity can't play, <laughs> everyone's not no. going to eat. <laughs> Gotta <laughs> love them like, grandmother. I just kind of knew then like, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to make it. <laughs> Excellent. Gotta love them grandmothers. What a beautiful footprint, footprint in your life. Miss Katie, Katie Holloway. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my defining moment came in college. So I uh, played college basketball on a prosthetic leg and um, my grandfather passed away in my sophomore year during preseason. And as many of you college athletes know, preseason is usually the hardest um, gearing up and conditioning. And we were conditioning at a practice that was significantly harder than normal the, the week after he had passed. And I remember running down the court and just running out the door. <laughs> and because I was like, I'm done, I'm done. I ran out the door and I was like a symbol of, li of life just going, you know what? I can't do this anymore, it's too hard. And my teammate came and got me. She brought me back into the gym and she said, you have to do this, you have to do this. And like continuing in that moment for me re made me realize I had to have heart to do what I was doing and that it was important for me and my grandfather to move forward and keep playing. And so that was my defining moment where I knew that there was still some heart in me and that was coming from my grandfather who built it in me. And that was my defining moment. That's the wind beneath your wings. That's a beautiful thing, the wind beneath our wings. Danielle Scott. Hi, thanks for having me too. Uh, defining moment, I think there are probably several different ones that I can, can name, but I'll start with just um, when I bought into a dream that someone had for myself. So I was super shy and quiet, and I was introduced to um, club and AAU volleyball at a late age in today's <laughs> world of starting as a three-year-old tot. Um, but I actually um, will start to get recruited and things. And then someone asked me, a reporter asked me, well, you think you're going to try out for the 92 Olympic Games? And I was like, whoa, is that a possibility? So I held on and kind of borrowed that dream. And, um, and then in college, after my freshman year, I made my first USA national team event. And I think those were, were the beginning defining moments for my getting involved like in, in sports and believing that I can actually play at a higher level. Beautiful. Miss Jessica. Hello, hello. Um, so I think uh, my defining moment sort of similar to Danielle in that um, it was a, the first international team I ever made when I was uh, 14 years old. 
And um, I just, I, I can still like, it's one of those memories that I've never forgotten. I remember crying, you know, I think it was the only time I probably ever cried making a team, but it was an overwhelming experience for me. And um, I knew I could, if I, if I worked hard and I dedicated myself to it, I could, I could really take it somewhere. Outstanding. And this, just this bubble of energy, Miss Colette Smith, please <laughs> share. Man, listen, my, I, I've had a few defining moments in my life when it comes to sports. But I got to tell you, uh, first of all, these, all these girls, I've been watching the, the symposium for a couple days now, right? These girls are my heroes. Um, I wish I was as strong as they are at my age that they are now, right? I wasn't until I was 42 years of age, 42 years old, I started playing pro football. And that was the pinnacle of my life. That was a rebirth. That was God telling me, you are strong, you are worthy, value yourself, go after your dreams, think big, you know, play harder. And, and for anyone that did anything wrong to me in my life, whether it be family, friends, coaches, or wannabe coaches, I was now wearing a, a cape. I was wearing a superhero cape for the first time in my life at 42 years old. Did I get my fill in in football? No, I did not. I didn't know about women's football, but that let me know how strong I am and, and, and to believe in myself, but it took a sisterhood to get me over that hurdle. So I'm just blessed to be here. I'm happy to see all your faces, each and every one of you. This is a good day. Wonderful. Well, ladies, let's start off. I'm going to uh, mix up some questions and I'm going to give some, I'm gonna shoot some to the athletes and then I'm going to shoot some to the coaches. And uh, Miss Chastity, you're going to go on both sides because you kind of was, you know, you're relevant on both sides. So let's start out with this. Um, as, as women in coaching, what's, what are a few aspects of the industry that favor men over women and how did you overcome them? Let's start out with Ms. Chastity, Colette, uh, Dr. Welter, and then Jarita, uh, please. Chastity. Okay. Um, some of the aspects I think that favor men that I, I'll just name two really quickly for me. One is just the aspect that they have, they're favored because they have a lot more opportunities. I mean, they just, I mean, right up front, they just have way more opportunities uh, not just in basketball, but to coach any sport, both male and female, they have more opportunities than the, the average female. And secondly, just the um, societal belief that their leadership is the best leadership in coaching. You know, like they're favored as far as like, as far as a man just has better leadership when coaching a team, I feel like. Shift that I, paradigm I, I, though. I'm sorry. How do we shift that paradigm? Yeah. How would you go about shifting that paradigm? Well, the first one, I would just encourage a lot of the male coaches that are head coaches to, you know, hire, you know, female assistants, even on the men's side and in different sports. I would encourage the female coaches that are head coaches to only hire female assistants. <laughs> But I only say that in the respect that we only have a few opportunities. So it's not like when, when um, Muffet McGraw said it, she said it because she knew there were just limited spots available for women to get into coaching. So she said she wanted to hire all women's staff. And it wasn't that she didn't feel like there were men that were qualified. She just knew, she finally understood, look, I'm in a position that I have three open seats I'm going to make them available for women as opposed I think you have to be intentional. Yeah, you have to be intentional. And I know, I know it's hard. And I mean, I know I will say hard. I know it's very challenging, but just look across the board. Men have a lot of opportunities and then they hire more men. So, it's, I mean, it just is what it is, but, and more women head coaches have to develop their assistants and encourage them and help teach them to be leaders to become head coaches. So that's what I would do. Colette? Yeah, I, to, 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 to follow up with what Chastity was saying is that um, for me, I've only seen male coaches in my entire life. And because I only really loved football, 
That's all I was concerned about personally. So knowing that there were never any women, it led me to believe, it made me think that I'm not worthy, I'm not capable of that. But the, the men's advantage is just that, coupled with the fact that they're a, bar, a, a part of the good old boys club. So these very men that are coaching on high level and acme level positions with the NFL, they played Pop Warner together. They went to high school together, they played on the same football team. They went to college together or even different universities, but they thought about each other, each other that didn't play a role for Sarah, Jessica, Jen, Colette, Chastity. We weren't involved in that. How so, did you break that barrier? That, well, you know what? I'm glad you asked that, Penny, because that barrier was broken, not about me thinking about me. It was me wanting to be a better coach for my women's pro football team. Now, I played pro football. I didn't play till I was 42 years old. I wasn't the greatest player and I'll be the first one to say it. But I'll tell you this, I was a student of the game. When I became a coach for my women's team, I was terrified, but excited, right? So a woman gave me the first opportunity and I'm gonna give back. Absolutely. The way that I changed that paradigm and changed the whole mix of it all was that I went to the Jets practices to learn to be a better coach, to bring back to my women. It wasn't about me. It was never about me. To this very day, it still is not about me. It is about what I can do to empower other women and especially my girls. And let me be very, let me be very clear here, especially little, little black girls in underserved neighborhoods. So I changed the paradigm because I was like, look, I'm coming, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna empower my women. And then the opportunity presented itself to me because I created it and I had, my heart was in, a good, in the right place. At the, end of the day, at the end of the day, one, you can feel how competitive fire. Oh. And then two, it's all about the love of the game. I believe we're all gatekeepers. That's what we do. We hold the gate open for others to be able to come right through. On. Dr. Welter, can you please tell me? Yeah, so, you know, for me, one of the things that's really distinct um, in football is that it's the one sport that doesn't have parity at any level from peewees to the pros, right? Other sports have opportunities where, you know, you might be in the court together, right? Like you might cross over, like you saw even with like, Becky and Pop, right? The teams were in the same building. So you get an opportunity to see not that this is a female or a male, but like this is a baller, right? And this is somebody I want around my program. And for me, um, I never would have gotten into coaching if I hadn't played the men's game. Um, so I was actually the first female to play running back in men's pro football. And in that season, I developed a respect with the guys as a baller, right? And we became close, just like teammates do. And so we had a new head coach come in the following season and he saw how the guys responded to me um, and it caught his attention. And he was like, who's this girl that all my guys love? And they were like, coach, that's your running back. Now he sits me down. He starts grilling me like Wendell Davis is no joke, right? He starts grilling me about football, the team, what's good, what's not. We had a good conversation, but I was kind of like, okay, you want to go? Like, let's go, right? Like, you want to talk ball? Like, let's talk. And the next day he said, all my DC and I were talking about is how you had to coach this football team. And I said, no. He said, what do you mean no? I said, women to coach football. And you want to throw me right into men's pro football? Like, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. I said, no, I hung up on him. The next day he called me back and told me he had taken the job on my behalf, okay? <laughs> so he said, you can quit if you want to, right? But you're, you're gonna coach this team. And for me, I wouldn't have stepped up into it because I didn't have somebody I could look at and say, I wanna be her. But once I was there, I wasn't gonna quit. And that's a really important difference between women and men, right? Men will oftentimes project themselves up into a situation, right? And yet women will overcheck the boxes of qualification. And so 
I lovingly say he drop kicked me into success because he saw something in me as a straight baller, um, as opposed to we're looking for a woman to curate and put onto the staff, right? And then a similar thing happened with going into the NFL. And what was so important about being the first female coach in the NFL is then it changes the mindset of people who see it. And they become more open to people who are curious and love the game like Colette who would come out to practices. And it's, it's not foreign to think, oh, a woman could do this because it's, it's been done. And what's important to build on that is then we look at all the places in society where women aren't, right? Like in coaching. And we find ways to change that narrative so that it's not so foreign right? Like being in the first female coach in Madden, okay? Why is that important? Because we could change the virtual space, right? And drive what happens on the field, right? So being, and sorry, it was the first head coach, right? And so then it becomes a playable character. What does that mean? Every girl who plays that video game can now see herself represented. And every boy who plays that video game sees that a coach is someone with knowledge, right? And so you don't have to, in football particularly, but in a lot of places in sports, you don't have to tell a girl she can't do it. It is reinforced in every place that she is not. So to change that dynamic, we have to look at all of those places and shift what's shown because it changes our mindset, right? From the established norm. And so every place that we can break down those pre-existing conditions makes us more likely that one of these girls who sees it will say, I wanna do that and start early and dream big and do the same work, right? So that when she gets the opportunity, you're there because you're good, not because we just need a girl, right? Well, and that's what, I, what I hear you saying, Dr. Dr. Jan, is a couple things now you had to be pushed into your purpose because you were pulling away. And then even after you got pushed into your purpose, you are changing the narrative. Once you change the narrative, you change our destiny. Right. So kudos to you. And Miss Jarita, please, may you please respond. Yes, ma'am. Um, I agree with everyone on here. Uh, I think for me, a few years ago, I decided to focus strictly on middle school sports. Uh, simply because I was up in high school sports seeing that a lot of our girls weren't playing basketball. A lot of our girls weren't playing uh, uh, running track because it was boyish, um, or at least that's the, the environment here in New Orleans. Like certain things are boyish, so we don't do that. So I made this step to go down to middle school because I wanted girls to understand that this doesn't make you any less of a girl, for one, but that is important. Like, I mean, that's what got me where I am. I ran track since I was a little like y'all's age and that's what got me where I am. And so I kind of take the, the, the I want to be the model type of feel. Um, I'm not a very vocal coach. I'm more of a, I'm going to show them and what I do. Um, and I want them to try to emulate that. Now I'm going to teach and coach and all of those things. But I really realized when talking about a mind shift, I really realized that we were reaching our girls too late. That by the time they made it to high school, by the time they made it to college, or if they went into pro sports, like they already had that mindset of, oh, well, when I finish being an athlete, like that's it for me. I can't go and coach because my coach was a male. Um, I can't go and coach because even the assistant coaches were male. So I was fortunate enough to have a female head coach um, in middle school and in high school. And so I saw someone that looked like me. And so that gave me, uh, you know, that mindset like, oh, I can do this. And I want to do the same thing for our youth. Okay, athletes, where do you think you would be today if you had never met or had been taught by your coach? So if I can get uh, Katie, uh, Danielle, and I'm leaving out an athlete, you have to forgive me, Jessica, please answer. Sure. If, um, if I had never met uh, Coach Carla at Cal State Northridge, um, I, I think, I, one, I think I would have quit halfway through. 
I really do. I think I would have uh, given up and not competed for the four years in college basketball. But the other thing I think where I would be is we had a very love-hate relationship, as many of us do with our coaches. She loved to push me and I loved to hate her for it. And um, literally in that day, it was physically pushed too, because I was a post player. So she would take this pad and just beat us with it and hammer us <laughs> until we could make our layup underneath the hoop. So, um, but Coach Carla, I knew loved me and I knew that she had my back and that she wanted me to be the most successful I would ever be in my life and that those were the hardest years I was gonna have. And that's absolutely true. Um, and so I don't know if I would be as mentally tough as I am today without her. Because at the end of the day, we really don't care how much they know, do we? We wanna just know how much they care and then yeah. we'll kind of give them our best. Yeah. <laughs> and she would fight for us. I knew, and I, the way I knew that was because she would fight for us post players when it was in a team environment and we were getting ragged on in, in film because we weren't doing our jobs. She would say, no, that wasn't the post players. That was the point guards. They didn't do defense down at the other end. So she always had our back. And that's how I knew um, she, was, she could be tough on me and that she still loved me. Well, it's going to be interesting to hear Danielle's perspective with her playing in five different Olympics. So we're talking about five different coaching staffs, as well as playing in college, playing basketball, volleyball. And did you do track also at Long Beach State? Ding! <laughs> answer that question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, well, first of all, I'm grateful for having the home support I did. It started with my mom and my parents at home. Um, but I was, like I said, really that shy kid. So had not Brian taken me under his wing and been like, no, this is the place you need to be, Brian Gemolero, that is. He's now retired from Long Beach State. This is the place you need to be. And then really pushing me and, and challenging me to play all the different positions and being well-rounded in the backcourt, um, when it came, uh, then it would have been really difficult for me to continue. And then like I had different coaches throughout my career, but as you keep playing and you get older, um, sometimes you get pushed to where like you ask questions more like, are you okay? Versus, <laughs> like, are you going to make this practice? Not like, how are you really doing today? Right. Um, so my coaches kind of challenged me in both ways in that regard as I got older. Um, but it really built up the resilience, you know, um, in my last Olympics, I had to come back after um, having had my daughter, you know, and if you know volleyball, you kind of start to see how the team is going. If you're going to make the team, if you're making travel teams, if, if you're a starter and not. And so just having to experience that um, and, you know, the player saying like, no, Danny, I think you're going to make this or maybe not saying that you're going to make it, but how they looked at me um, in the practices and my work ethic that they appreciate, appreciated um, that really made a difference in my being able to keep going. I mean, Hugh McCutcheon, you know, I would go in and have these meetings and he would say, you know, your stats are better, um, but not yet. I mean, in some cases they were better than some of the other places, but he included that little word yet that gave me hope that, okay, so I'm still in this battle. All right, then we can go for this. I can keep working hard. I can grind for you. I can be the best teammate. And so without coaches like that, who know how to give you just what you need to keep pushing you, to pursue the dream that you have, the goals that you have for yourself and, and as a teammate, um, you know, that really makes a difference. And then, of course, I've had countless international coaches as well who really drive you in different ways. Some saw me, you know, used me in a leadership position. And then other times I was used to push other, uh, other people. Like, like Katie said, I was really pushed to do 20,000, you know, hits, you know, when their players are out there sitting on the side icing. Right, but those things all help you build up your mindset, your toughness, your resilience to um, overcome any- One of those tricks, icing. I was one of those tricks, icing. I was one of those tricks staying warm on a machine. Right. Angry, <laughs> but, then, but, but then also, I, I, I love that I had to not do the suicides, the 300 yarders, right? <laughs> so I was like, well, this is not that bad. But the hunger in me was like, let's go. But then, yeah, you did how many sports? 
Come oh. on. <laughs> I did four sports. I did hey. actually in, in high school as well, but <laughs> I went on to do uh, the, the three in college. But yeah, those type of things like when in, in like Japan, for instance, you know, when I played professionally, a lot of the athletes would get their contracts where they wouldn't have to do the two practices. Well, I didn't mm. like that in my, in my practice, in my contract. I wanted to grind and be in there. So you're not going right. to have any excuse to not let me play or be better. So I would, sometimes we would even have three practices. And I think Ari Salinger was really one of those coaches. Uh, Rose could talk about it. Maybe you too, even Penny, right? Who would really drill and drill and drill and drill you. But by the time you got to the game, um, you definitely were prepared. In middle the game was an easy walkthrough, but right. good. Jessica, can you please share? Sure. Um, so a little bit of my backstory is that I was injured in a car accident when I was seven. And so my very first coach was actually one of the um, therapists at the hospital because there was a, a youth adaptive sports program based out of it. And so the, um, I love to tell the story because sort of like um, Jen, I had to be pushed and forced into things uh, many times in my life and I'm better for it. And so this, um, my coach, my first coach, Andy Chasnoff, actually had to drive to my house after I was discharged from the hospital um, and sort of forced me to go to my very first practice. And he got a speeding ticket on his way home. So he always likes to remind me that I owe money still today <laughs> for that ticket. And then, um, you know, I, I had a, a pretty long career. So I have had a few coaches. Um, my dad took over coaching me while I was a teenager. So, you know, mixed father as coach and uh, teenage years. And it was very... <laughs> very tumultuous, but um, he got me to my very first Paralympic Games, which was um, obviously amazing. And then I think the one who had the most influence on my athletic career was my college coach, Adam Bleakney. Um, and I think the thing that, you know, stands out in all of them, all of the successful coaches I've had has been um, their ability to push me when I didn't want to be pushed, right? Um, and, and then knowing your limits, right? So they're not going to push you to the point of pain, but they're going to push you to the edge of it. And, uh, and continue to try and make you better even when you're ready to give up. Don't you all think, and I know you're gonna, just give me a thumbs up, that sport is a beautiful laboratory that prepares us for America, it prepares us for life. It gives us a resilience, a, relentless, a relentlessness that we know we can push through anything. Um, Chastity, I want you to respond because Hall of Famer from North Carolina State, and kind of on both sides. You've had to pay your dues on both sides. So I'd like to hear your, your uh, perspective on your coaches. Well, um, rest in peace to my college coach, Kay Yao. She was very instrumental in making me, not, I mean, helping me become the woman that I am today on and off the court. Um, just her resilience, battling, you know, breast cancer, a survivor uh, throughout my college years. And also, you know, she paved the way here in North Carolina when she first took the job at NC State and hearing her stories. And someone asked me yesterday, they were like, who do you trust? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going through all these kind of, you know, social justice and all this stuff. But she was like, do you trust any white women? I said, yeah, but Coach K, yeah, I trust her. <laughs> And it was funny. I mean, it wasn't funny, but it was just like, that was the first white female that I actually trusted that, you know, treated everyone the same. Um, she was a small town country girl. So she was raised in the South with me, but she just taught me so many lessons. And, um, and I really, I really truly am who I am because of that experience with her, because I was, I was, I'm, I mean, my backstory, I'm from a very small town. Uh, not even a town with the population, maybe less than a thousand. So um, I was in a box. And so Coach Al helped me get out of that box. And, um, you know, it was where Black people lived on one side of the tracks and white people lived on the other. So Coach Al was very instrumental in helping me become the, not only the athlete that I became, but, you know, the, the woman that I am off the court. So um, coaches are super instrumental. But um, for me, I had a female coach in high school as well taught me about leadership. Um, I remember I was goofing off with everyone else and um, she did, she missed practice and she had left me in charge. And so the next day when she came back, she said, Chance, you did like everyone else. 
And I was looking at her like, I, I mean, I'm a kid. She was like, no, you're different. You're a leader. You're, you know, and so um, that was very instrumental. So I had some great coaches and that's, that's probably why later on I want to, I, I want to be the coach I am today. I think we don't realize because we're so used to seeing men in the head coaching position, but I didn't realize until really listening to you guys right now, I've been coached by so many women. And I made sure that my daughter was coached by a woman. I, I was my daughter's first coach. And she's playing volleyball now at MSU Denver. And she's playing for a woman. But I didn't realize how instrumental that really, really has been in my life. With that being said, I want to say, ask the question to you coaches, how is disciplining your athletes different from male coaches? And what resistance do you encounter from your athletes? Dr. Walter, Colette, and Chastity, if you can answer, as well as Jarita, please, in that yeah. order. So the, the first thing I'm gonna say is I think having played for a long time, right? And, and been an athlete much longer than a coach, for me, it was like from each of those coaches, you pick up something, right? And, and whether it's something that's great that you wanna make sure that you bring to your athletes or something that you're like, oh, I, I don't wanna be that coach, right? Like we're, we're students of the game, but we're also students of like the game within the game, right? And, and that's how we build teams. That's how we treat people. We are, are experiential. And so hopefully great coaches are, you know, kind of this great mix of the, the, the people who have brought them along the way. Um, I mean, I've been undersized and underestimated my whole career. People often think of me as being this giant person, right? Because I played against men and coached men, but I'm five foot two, right? I am five foot two, 130 pounds. And I was never the one that somebody was like, oh, you'll be one of the best in the world one day, right? Like shock value, right? Nobody picked the five two girl, right? And yet the thing that stuck out to most coaches about me was the way that I played bigger than I was, right? And my, my coach in the revolution, who was the men's coach once said to me, he's like, man, Welter, if I could take the heart out of your chest and put it in every one of these men, we would be undefeated. And so that always really resonated with me when particularly I went into coaching and I, you know, I never, I have coached women since, but I coached men first. And the thing that I heard over and over, cause I always had these NFL big brothers was that the game doesn't love you. And, you know, you're only as good as your last play. So when I went into coaching, the first thing that I led with was love, right? I want you to know that I love you and I'm always going to do the best for you, right? And if you know that I love you and you trust that that's what we're going with, that doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect, but I'm going to have perfect intention, right? They may have switched something in the game plan and I missed it. I called a blitz and it didn't work, but I'm never going to give you something that's not for you. Um, and so even in my communication style with them, if something was off, um, I was the queen of like the strong pull aside. I'm not going to call you out in front of all these people, but I'm going to call you to the side and say, hey, okay, on this, what happened, right? And the fact that I didn't approach kind of like those situations in the same way, let the guys know that they could talk to me both about things on the field and off. And it wasn't my role to be the disciplinarian, right? That's, that's more on the head coach. But as the assistant, what I found is that I could often translate the misses in communication that were happening, right? And see a guy who maybe got called out and he didn't know why. He wasn't getting called out because he was bad. He was getting called out because we needed him to start. And so my place wasn't really to be a disciplinarian. Um, and yet it was to hold people accountable. And I think those are two very different things. And they would always say like, man, the one thing coach Jen doesn't play about is technique. Like she's a beast on fundamentals. Well, yeah, of course I'm five foot two. 
I was not going to outbig anybody unless they were like eight. So coming from and leaning on the things that you're best and using those assets to bring the best out of each of your athletes, I think is what's really important. And then in terms of discipline, when I have been a head coach, right, I was the head coach of the first Australian women's national team, which was the first time in an international space in American football that there had been a female head coach, right? And yet what I found in that situation, um, I did have one assistant female, um, but most of them were guys because just the knowledge base and guys is there, is that I could be the tough one, right? Because the girls wanted to be like me as a player and they're like, oh, I want to do what she did. And the guys were more like the, oh, okay, you know, like let's come in and fill in the blanks. And so it was really interesting because where you are in the relationship and who is in charge of the discipline also means that the assistant coaches have different roles in how they make up a great cohesive unit so that the players are hearing the same things consistently, right? In terms of what you have to do, right? We're not gonna have different rules for you versus you. That's something that's- Absolutely. But Absolutely. how we translate it um, might be in somebody else's role, right? It might be a little bit different. When you say that it could be, especially when we're dealing with Generation Z right now, but what I've also found is that you celebrate out loud, but you chastise in a whisper with this gen. They tend to respond quite differently when, when you're going to hold them accountable. Like you said, you didn't have to do it out loud, but you can pull them to the side. I think you get more out of them, but I totally agree. Question for you, Ms. Collette. And that How is letting them know that, you know, that sometimes it's like, are you okay? Right? This is not a play you would usually make, right? Are you doing okay? Is something on your mind? Because we all know it, like if you're a great athlete and your performance really shifts from one day to the next, it's not like you've lost the ability to do it. But if your mind is somewhere else, right? That's where a lot of the mistakes happen. And just even noticing, right? That somebody's a little different today. And like, are you okay? If you wanna talk, let me talk, can, can be that shift that even is enough to bring them into the moment and back to the play. But it or also the, develops that relationship. And it's not just like, oh, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? It's like, hey, what is going on that we got to this place? Or the Danielle question, are you going to make it through practice today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing enough to ask means right. a whole lot because that means they mean something to you. But it right? also means you have a relationship with your players because yep. you're not just, you're just not doing the X's and O's. You're going beyond that. So... Miss Colette. Yeah. Tell so, me about you know, I, I listen, when when I think about football and I think about women in sports, I think about my childhood and my life. I think about my mom and dad who were not allowed to ride the bus because they were black. Right? I think about that when it comes to women in sports. And so to me, it's not just about being a girl or a woman in sports. It is about all the injustices in the world that people, human beings have to go through. So for me in football, I, I'll tell you this, when I was coaching with the New York Jets, and listen, I, I, was, I was aware that I was gonna be their first female coach in, in, in their franchise history, I knew that. Billie Jean King, who's a good dear friend of mine, who I love the pieces, sees me at a Title IX event for the 40th anniversary in New York City. I'm wearing makeup, lipstick, a dress, and high heels. And I'm like, why not bring my football helmet? Why not? <laughs> That's just how I roll. And so um, I walk in the room, I see Billie Jean King, and she says, Mind you, I see her. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to get a picture with Billie Jean King. She's my dad's favorite player ever. She's my idol. But I'm like, I don't want to ask for the picture. Billie Jean King sees me, and she says, Colette. Get over here. And she said some other words. I will not say them now. But they was all in love. And she said to me, do you realize that you're the first Black woman to coach NFL history? And how fly is that? And I said, did you just say the word fly, Billy? And she was like, I said that. I said that. So I'm like, I'm in more awe of her. But I didn't realize that I was the first Black woman. OK? And no shade here, but 
minorities are minorities. A woman, whether she be white or black, is that. But they're more apt to give a white woman a chance than a black person. Let's be very clear about this. So to be the first black, I'm in, I'm in awe. My players, when I got on that field, the players, by the way, the NFL is comprised of majority black players, period. They were like, they were, they were coming up to me, embracing me like coach. And just to hear an NFL player say coach to me is something I needed to hear from my life. It breathed soul. It gave me wing beneath my wings. And I needed it. And as strong as I came in, I was scared. Let's be very clear about this. I was scared to death. And as, as scared as I was, I was equally passionate about it. And so these players to me, they weren't even my peers because these are kids. I'm 51 years old today. These guys are coming out of college at 19, 20 years old with million dollar contracts. They're children to me. They may be great athletes. And I love that I could assess the personnel on the field. I had Gamal Adams number one draft pick from LSU. He was going to be the end all be all to a team. Well, any person, especially a person in sports and especially a coach knows that you can't take one player and turn your whole team around. Your team may be better, but that one player, it doesn't, it doesn't it, what I'm getting at is that it doesn't depend on one person, one player, one coach. It is a across the board situation. Yes, and I was able to, I had the head coach telling me, Coach Todd Bowles, by the way, my book, first black man to be, a, well, not first, he was a black man and was a head coach. Of course, I'm like, what, what? <laughs> so I was all about it and I wanted him to excel. He would say to me sometimes, coach, you better get him, you better get him, you better slow him down. And I'm like, and I would look at Coach Bowles and I would say, I already spoke to him and I slowed him down. He goes, what? And I'm like, so what you're seeing now could have been far worse. But I will go back and I will do that for you. But the players responded very well to me. And like, when, when you're a player, like Jarita, when, when you're playing, you're assessed in different ways, right? Every player is unique. One coaching style may work great for five players, not for these 14. So can we assess that? Because I had an innate ability to be able to sit back, assess the room, assess the field, and say, OK, wait a minute. This is not happening. It's not working. And I used to love going into Coach Bull's office. His office was like right next to my cubicle. And I used to try to beat him in every morning. And he would say to me, because I would always come in and I'd pick my head in and he would do this to me. I'm here first. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> all right, I see you. And then I would come in earlier every morning and I still never beat him first. But the we, love of the game. The game planning of it all, right? Love and, of the game. And we would sit down and I was not afraid. I mean, I was afraid, but closed mouths don't get fed. So I would go in there and I would say, you know what? The reason why these plays didn't work is because our personnel is wrong for the plays. You got okay. Buster playing smart. But, but Miss Colette, we're on discipline. So Chastity, how is discipline in your athletes different from uh, male coaches when they discipline them? Do you get any resistance? Um, I you know, I tend to say that after coaching men and being on a, a, a male dominated staff, there aren't really differences between male and females as far as discipline goes. I just think it depends on the coach's personality. I mean, for me, I, my personality, I'm faith based. So I don't use a lot of swear words just because if I did, my players would laugh at me, <laughs> you know, but then there's coaches that, you know, it, they use it with power. I mean, that's their language, you know, so that's not my language. So, um, and that's not necessarily discipline, but while you're disciplined, the type of language you use, I mean, I have a stern voice as it is. So my voice just using it 
um, in general is, is stern enough while disciplining someone. But sometimes, and, I mean, I know females that use those types of languages just like males. And um, obviously, and I've also found that there's a double standard when women do do that and have lost jobs because of that. Well, tell um, me this. Do you think culture has a lot to do with it? Who, tell me one of the best coaches that you've had or seen at, in their craft have set a culture where they can police themselves when we talk about a standard of training versus a coach constantly have to keep them training at a certain level. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, obviously I have to, <laughs> it's, it almost baffles me to say this, but I haven't really had one since Coach K. Yao. And that's what I was gonna say that I've, I've learned um, when I first got into coaching people, because I played for such a very long time, thank God I was fortunate to do that. People be like, well, how do you feel like you, you, you could be a coach? And I said, well, I know what not to do. <laughs> you know, because I've, I've had some, I mean, over these years, I've had a few, quite a few interesting uh, coaching experiences. Um, so for me, what I've learned and what Coach Al taught me is with discipline, it's just, it's all about accountability and being consistent with everyone. And um, so that's just try, how I try to pattern myself as a coach is try to come every day and be consistent in who Chastity Melvin is. And I feel like some of the coaches I had, whether we win or lose, you know, okay, how's coach going to be today? Or how's coach coming in this way? And, and as a player with the rest of my teammates, we hated that. You know, all day mentally you're preparing with like, how's coach going to be today? And for me, with Coach K. Yao through – every adversity she was the same person every day and I don't know how she does it but people say that to me today but I mean I think it has a lot to do with my faith just coming in and being consistently who you are consistent. now obviously you're not aren't going to be perfect with that because everyone hates to lose um but at the end of the day for the for the majority of the time you need to be consistently the the coach and and the person you are on and off the court and I think that's what holds players accountable more accountable and you can um express your discipline i mean discipline players and athletes in the team in a consistent way when they when they trust you're going to be the same person every day and hold everyone accountable i totally agree it's funny i i saw a saying the other day that said culture eats strategy for lunch coach eats strategy for breakfast and basically you can be the best strategist the best scout team you can be the best x and o's team but unless you have truly established a real culture in your gym on your field then you're not going to get the best out of your out of your athletes and i think that comes from a coach like you said being consistent and understanding dr jen i love your perspective as well coming from an assistance point of view my my goal is not to discipline but i am here to hold you accountable but also to remind you and that support system that's going to always get the best out of you that's going to be your hype man that's colette she's going to always be your best hype woman but um that's a beautiful thing i totally agree with it all jarita do you find that when you're disciplining your student athletes that there's some uh resistance than if there was a man that was disciplining them definitely um Years I've been coaching middle school girls, so there's definitely some resistance, um, especially being that prior to me stepping in with along with the coach who was there at the school, uh, they did not have anyone to coach, so they did not have certain sports for girls, and so they uh, the the resistance was well I'm gonna go practice with the boys because I mean they had other women female teachers here or female people people here who play basketball and so they didn't step up and do nothing so what are y'all gonna come and do um and so yeah there was definitely some resistance um I kind of agree with everyone with what everyone is saying like it took us building their trust and building relationships with them I completely agree I can't remember I can feel y'all said it but um individualizing um you we cannot treat all athletes the same we cannot treat all people the same and so knowing that uh, especially in my case when dealing with children, some, a child may be able to take me speaking at a sterner tone with them and another child may break apart. Um, and so, you know, having that understanding and knowing your athletes is very important when disciplining them. Uh, but yeah, definitely some pushback. 